Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. We are an inclusive faith community seeking to live out the loving, just, and generous way of Jesus. We are participants in a long tradition that's less concerned with doctrines and dogma that demand total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is precious, that we are made by love in order to love. This community is comprised of and affirms the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So, if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to celebrate, if you are uprooted and have come to belong, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home.
So steadfast, rent the dark, veil for the soul. Whither the master has entered, robbing the grave of its gold. Come, then, oh, come, glad fruition, come to my sad, beating heart. Come, oh, thou blessed hope of glory. Whispering hope, how welcome thy voice, making my heart in sorrow rejoice. Whispering hope, how welcome thy voice, making my heart in sorrow. Good morning. I hope your summer months are off to a great start. I want to let you know about a few things coming up. First, if you're curious how Crosspoint is able to do all the things we do, ministries, community partnerships, Sunday mornings, paying bills for members of our community, our community garden, etc., etc., it's through donations. 100%. So if you want to find out more about how to partner with us financially, you can go to crosspoint.org slash contribute or text crosspoint NC to 77977. Now, one of the highlights of our Crosspoint summer is Story Night. It's an event we do pretty much every year, and it's a time when storytellers from Crosspoint come and tell a true story around a theme. And this year's theme is imposter. 
Story Night is coming up this Tuesday, June 25th, and it'll be held at Fortnite Brewery in Cary. We have some great stories and some music for you. You can find out all the details at the Crosspoint main page, crosspoint.org. We would love for you to let us know you're coming so that we can let Fortnite know how many people to expect. And we would love to know that information by Monday, tomorrow, if possible. Regardless, we hope to see you there. It's a fun event. Now, many of you have heard of our friend Spencer LaJoy. We are big fans. They are an incredible musical artist and just an incredible, amazing person. They will be in person at Crosspoint Sunday Services on July 14th. We hope that you'll make plans to attend that day if you're able. We also wanna point you to another opportunity to see Spencer in concert with a full band that includes our very own Stephen Claybrook and Dale Baker on July 10th in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. It's about 30 minutes from Crosspoint at a place at a church actually called The Plant. Tickets are required for this event, and you can visit our website to find the link, or you can use the QR code, and it'll take you directly to the ticket site. We would love to have a bunch of Crosspoint support for Spencer if you're able to make it. Lastly, a few times a year, we take a break, a rest from in-person services, and usually one of those dates is around July 4th weekend. So July 7th is one of those dates that we will not meet in person. This gives our volunteers some time off. It gives us all the opportunity to do what we say is important, spending time with friends and community and family, resting, rejuvenating, whatever it is that you need to do that day to recharge. Now, if Sunday morning content is an important part of your week, there will be content available that Sunday online. But again, we won't meet in person on July 7th. There are a lot of other ways to get involved this summer. For kids, adults, college students, students, you can check out all of that at our summer calendar on our main website, crosspoint.org. Crosspoint, hope you have a great week. Keep loving and caring for yourself and others well. See you later. Hey, Crosspoint. So, in all my years of talking with people over faith-related issues, the one thing that I've discovered that shapes and influences varying perspectives more than anything else is the assumption someone carries about the Bible and the role they believe it should serve in everyone's life. In my experience, that is by far the number one factor. Both my boys and their liberal arts college experiences were required to take one religious class. And the stories that they would share from those classes would always just blow my mind. In each instance, they had professors who hold PhDs in biblical studies. And yet, the number of times they would tell me stories about their classmates who after class, or sometimes even in class, would openly mock their professors and call them idiots or false teachers or sheep in wolves clothing that people should be warned about for doing nothing more than simply introducing multiple perspectives on how to approach or interpret a particular passage in the Bible. I mean, it was wild. And I'm not suggesting a student should never question a teacher or come to a different conclusion than a professor, of course not. But I do think that when someone is considered an expert in their field, that should compel us to listen and at least consider their perspective without immediately dismissing it as ignorant just because it challenges our own. And yet the truth is, I remember being pretty similar when I was 18. I grew up in a very religiously and politically conservative church where I was taught that any perspective other than the Bible says it, that settles it, was being unfaithful to God. It was lukewarm, half-hearted faith that could potentially risk eternal fiery torture for myself or for anyone I interacted with. And so I was told if I cared at all about people, I had to be hard-lined about all this stuff. It was life or death. And so even to entertain different ideas was putting yourself on a very slippery slope to destruction. So I get it. Because when that's your ultimate framework and assumption about the Bible, it literally shapes and influences how you see everything else. There isn't room for context or nuance, discussion, literary styles of ancient literature, different interpretations based on other people's experiences where we can learn from one another and get more enriched, broader views of the divine and what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. It easily becomes, there's only one way to see it. And if you don't see it that way, you're against us 
that do. And more than that, you're against God. And so for some of us, I imagine you found yourself in situations with friends or loved ones or even just some random people where you end up brokenhearted or you just want to bang your head up against the wall in frustration because it doesn't seem like there's any room around certain topics and conversations for different perspectives, even when they're rooted in genuine love and respect for other people. And that's because often the factor that is driving everything else in the conversation is one's assumptions about the Bible. And so what that means is for many people with a context for faith, until there's an openness about how we can view what's written throughout the various letters, poems, and literary accounts in the Bible, those kinds of conversations just aren't helpful or productive. And so I want us to try to do some heavy lifting in the biblical scholarship world today and try to shed some light and perspective that I genuinely hope can lead to healthier discussions about the Bible. But first, let's start with Twitter or X or whatever it's called these days. I shared this years ago, but I once posted a tweet one afternoon a ways back that read this way. I once had a friend who lost $22 million at the casino one afternoon. That same night, he won $9 million at the casino. Clearly, my friend is the best gambler ever because he won $9 million in one night. Amazing. Now, I know you're probably thinking, well, with profound content like that, why doesn't Jonathan have a lot more followers on Twitter? Exactly, right? And I get it, it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. And if you were to look back over my profile of very few tweets over the past few years, it would seem to be pretty random because I rarely put stuff out there. But I want you to see another post that was made by the vice president at the time, Mike Pence. And if you look at the timestamp, it was less than 24 hours earlier. He wrote, we've created more jobs in the last three months than Joe Biden and Barack Obama created in their eight years in office. Now, before you think I'm getting too partisan here, just hang with me for a second. Both Republican and Democratic politicians manipulate these kinds of talking points all the time, whichever way causes their preferred interest to appear in a more favorable light. This is just the example I used that day. And to be clear, I've publicly critiqued both the last administration and this current administration on specific issues, so don't assume I have some other agenda until you hear me all the way out. But the reality is, when this statement was made, the U.S. economy had lost 22 million jobs since the beginning of the pandemic. And in my opinion, this would have likely happened in some similar degree, regardless of which partisan group was in charge at the time. But six months into the pandemic, when this statement was made by the vice president, it is true that the U.S. economy had successfully reemployed 9 million of those jobs in the previous three months. But it is also true that we were still 13 million jobs in the hole from where we started. And so the idea that one would claim we've created more jobs in the past three months than the previous administration did in their eight years is an incredibly misleading, if not flat out ridiculous statement. So I found myself frustrated. Frustrated that that type of manipulative political jargon, which again is often used by both sides of the political aisle, continues to take advantage of people and arm them with talking points to be used as weapons against others when it's all just a lie. And so I gave myself a night to sleep on it. And then the next day I posted this. I once had a friend who lost $22 million at the casino one afternoon. That same night he won $9 million at the casino. Clearly my friend is the best gambler ever because he won $9 million in one night. Amazing. And in a sense, I told my own little parable as a critique of current events that were happening at the time. But if one wasn't following the current political news of the time, it would make complete sense that they may think, well, that was just random and weird. I mean, I don't get it. What's the point? And then imagine someone else reading it several years, decades, or centuries from now, reading that same tweet without the awareness of what was going on politically at the time I wrote it. So much about the intent would easily be missed. And someone could just assume I was literally talking about the gambling habits of one of my friends. Now, the thing is, this type of storytelling, it isn't new. Take the classic 1953 play, The Crucible, written by Arthur Miller. In the play, Miller dramatizes and gives a partially fictional account of the real Salem witch trials that took place in the 1690s. 
But the play wasn't actually about the Salem witch trials that had happened 300 years earlier. Instead, Miller's actual intentions were to critique realities in his own current circumstances in the 1950s, specifically what was known as McCarthyism, when the U.S. government went on a witch hunt of sorts for communists that they believed had infiltrated America, making all sorts of wild accusations and persecuting people for being communist or being sympathizers to communists. Arthur Miller himself had been accused and had experienced the persecution firsthand, and so he wrote this play, The Crucible, as a critique on McCarthyism, using the events of the Salem witch trials as an allegory of sorts. Now, perhaps more familiar to some of you would be the movie and the subsequent TV series, MASH, that kicked off in 1969, where the movie tells the story of American troops during the Korean War, set in the 1950s. But for all those of us who know and love the show, they know it's offering commentary on another war, the Vietnam War that was taking place when it was written and shown on television starting in 1969. Now Shakespeare uses the same type of literary device in his storytelling and countless others do as well throughout history. And so what I wanna to suggest to you today is that there is strong evidence that the storytelling in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, often functions in much of the same way. Now, much of what I want to share with you today is based off the research of a professor named Gary Rinsberg, who currently teaches at Rutgers, but was also at Cornell for about 18 years. He has a doctorate in Hebrew studies. He's an expert in biblical scholarship, the Hebrew language, and in ancient Judaism. And almost 20 years ago, he gave a talk on his research. You can still find it online. And most of what I'm going to share in these next few moments comes from his research. A little bit comes from another biblical expert, Peter Inns, who's taught here before and is a friend of ours here at Cross Point. And then I'll throw in some more of my own thoughts and observations along the way, especially when it gets to why I think this matters to you and I today. Because again, even though it may require us to swim in kind of some nerdy biblical scholarship waters for a bit, I really do think at the end it can be helpful. So let's start establishing some context for Genesis. The general consensus among biblical scholars is that Genesis was written during the monarchy of Israel highlighted by the reigns of people like King Saul, King David, King Solomon, etc. Some names you may or may not be familiar with. But in this period of Israelite kings ruling from Jerusalem, it lasted about 400 years from around 1000 BCE to 600 BCE. And this reign of the monarchy came to an end right after 600 BCE when the Babylonians invaded and conquered Jerusalem. And the Israelite people went into exile, basically enslaved to the Babylonians for about 70 years until they returned to Jerusalem after being set free in the 530s BCE. And so what many scholars like Rensburg suggest is that Genesis is offering commentary on the monarchy likely being written when the monarchy is alive and active, with some other portions of Genesis being written probably after the monarchy has fallen. And the argument goes that the monarchy was the pinnacle of Israel's story. It was at the height of Israel's power and influence, having gone on this journey from being slaves in Egypt to wandering around in the desert for 40 plus years to establishing themselves as a nation and then becoming this powerful monarchy in the world to then seeing it collapse and being enslaved by the Babylonians again, and then eventually returning to Jerusalem in this very humbled posture. And so after all these ups and downs in their history, these authors of Genesis find themselves wrestling with, how did we get here as a people? How did we get to this moment? How did we get here when we were at the very height of our power? And then at other points, how did we screw it all up? When we thought we had arrived, we were on top. How did we screw all this up? How did we get to this humbled position we find ourselves in after it all collapsed? I often compare it to the Star Wars saga, where you have the original and, of course, best movies. But then afterwards, you had people wrestling with, like, okay, now we're interested in how did we get here? What's the backstory to all of this? And thus, the prequels in Star Wars were born. Well, Genesis works kind of like that. But Rinsberg argues that just like the Crucible and MASH and works of Shakespeare, Genesis is offering commentary on present day issues clothed in stories from the past. It's speaking to the monarchy and commenting on the author's present day reality while using these ancient stories to do it. So to be clear, I'm not suggesting this is the only way to see it. I just want you to see how this framework plays itself out and something to consider in how we think and talk about the Bible. 
So let's take the story of Adam from the very beginning of Genesis. In suggests that rather than seeing Adam as the account of the first human being, what if we think of Adam's story as a condensed version of Israel's entire saga? So let's consider the parallels of the two stories. You have Adam, created by God out of the dust of the earth, placed into this lush paradise called the Garden of Eden. And God gives Adam a command to follow. Do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if you do, you're going to die. Well, Adam does end up eating from the tree, but rather than being struck down dead, Adam and Eve are driven out of the garden, out of the paradise, ex exiled from the land that they were given. But what if when you and I read Adam, we think Israel? Because consider Israel's story. The people of Israel were birthed out of the dust of slavery in Egypt, in the desert, where God delivered them and placed them in the promised land, this lush paradise of Cana, where it was described as a land flowing with milk and honey. And God gives the Israelites the Ten Commandments, gives them the law of Moses, and they're told that if they obey the commandments, they will get to stay, stay in this land, in this paradise, and thrive in it. But if they disobey, they'll be exiled from the land, which is exactly what happens to Israel. Same thing that happened to Adam. An interesting side note, in at least two different places in the Old Testament, Israel's exile from the land is referred to as a death, just like Adam's exile is referred to as a death in Genesis. And so from the opening pages of Genesis, we're given some clues with Adam's story and some rather striking parallels that Genesis is going to be addressing Israel's journey as a people and as a nation. And again, the pinnacle of that is the monarchy and specifically a king known as King David. Now, there's lots of different examples that we could explore, but I wanna try and just look at one story that we find in Genesis chapter 38. Because as you read through Genesis, it kinda of comes out of nowhere, this particular story. There's this long epic story of a man named Joseph. The one, maybe you remember, he has this coat of many colors. It was a Broadway show based off of that. But the story of Joseph gets dramatically interrupted with a story that we find in Genesis 38. Just kind of comes out of nowhere. And then the story of Joseph just continues on after it, just like nothing ever happened. It's just this inserted story. And so it's abruptly placed inside this existing narrative in this way to draw attention to it. Now, if you want to read the whole story, feel free. You can go read it on your own in Genesis chapter 38. But here's the general summary. There's this man named Judah. And it says that he marries a woman, but it doesn't give her her name. It doesn't give her name. It only describes her as the daughter of Shua. So they go on to have children together, and their oldest son is given to a wife who's named Tamar. Now, as the story goes, this oldest son, husband to Tamar, was considered evil, and so the Lord puts him to death. So Tamar was given another one of Judah's sons, but he too was found to be evil, and so the Lord puts him to death as well. So it's important to understand this ancient context here that Tamar had next to no rights in her position. Without a husband and without any children, she had no place of security in the family, no security for her own livelihood. She could easily be viewed as just expendable and damaged goods. And so Judah says to Tamar, okay, go live as a widow in my father's household. And when my youngest son is old enough, I will give him to you to be his wife. But in essence, this leaves her in limbo because since she's promised to this future son, Tamar can't engage in any other relationships, and yet she still has no security. Well, over the course of many years, it became clear that Judah had no intention of ever giving Tamar to his youngest son, even after he was long past growing up. And so Tamar takes her future into her own hands. Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. And after she had grieved, Judah, who was a shepherd, went on this business trip of sorts with a friend named Hira to check on all the sheep in a nearby town. And I know this is a lot of names, but hang in there with me because it'll matter. So he leaves the town of Adullam where he and his family were living and goes on this trip. Tamar hears about this business trip of Judah and goes and disguises herself and dresses up like a prostitute and sits down at the entrance to this other town. And so when Judah sees this woman who has her face covered, he assumes she's a prostitute and asks her to sleep with him. They strike a deal for the payment that Judah says, I'll deliver on that later. And so Tamar asks for something to hold on to his collateral until he can pay up. And she asks for his staff and his seal. 
So when you picture these items, imagine something like a personalized ring maybe that Judah could use to uniquely mark or stamp his property and communications with. It would confirm his identity to other people. So Judah agrees to the payment. They sleep together and Tamar becomes pregnant, but Judah remains clueless. When Judah sends someone to repay his debt and retrieve what he left as collateral to get his collateral back, his staff and a seal, the woman has disappeared. And so he just keeps quiet about the whole thing. Well, eventually, Tamar, who has gone back to living as basically an enslaved widow, she starts to show in her pregnancy. And one day, Judah is told that Tamar has prostituted herself in some way, violating the terms that Judah had placed on her and had become pregnant. So Judah is incredibly offended, and he orders that Tamar be brought before him and burned to death. And as she was brought out before Judah, she declares, I am pregnant by the man who owns these. And she shows him the steel, the seal and the staff. And so it's this incredibly dramatic scene. And now at this point, Judah is stuck because he must either one, admit his own guilt, or two, remain quiet about it and kill his only potential heir. Which again, in the ancient world, carrying on one's bloodline was everything. So he ends up admitting his guilt, and the truth is revealed, and Tamar gives birth to twin boys. Now, I get that that's kind of a quick overview of a story with lots of details, again, but here's where things get even more interesting. Rinsberg argues that the story is presented this way in Genesis, not simply to recount an ancient story from Israel's past, but rather to offer commentary on an event that was happening in the author's current day and time that would speak to the state of the monarchy at the height of its prominence. And in this particular case, point toward a scandalous story from the life of King David who was undoubtedly the centerpiece of Israel's monarchy and its history. We read about the same story elsewhere in the Bible where King David sees a woman bathing on a rooftop who was not his wife, who was in fact married to another man, we're told, whose name is Uriah. Well, King David decides he wants her for himself. So he sends for her, has her brought to him, uses his power and authority to sleep with her, most likely against her will, and she becomes pregnant. And then King David devises a scheme to have her husband Uriah killed. Now, I'm not going to try to walk through all the details of David's life that we find in the scriptures because we just we don't have time for that. But Rinsberg points out some very interesting parallels here between the two stories. In these two stories, we have the unjust sexual exploit of Judah and the unjust sexual exploit of David, who was famously promoted as being from the line of Judah. We also know from the stories that both David and Judah were named as shepherds. Additionally, as part of their individual stories, David and Judah each separate from their families and they go to a town called Adullam. Another interesting parallel. In the first story, remember, Judah's wife isn't named. Rather, she's called the daughter of Shua, which in Hebrew is Bat-Shua, which is very close to the Hebrew word for Bathsheba, which in Hebrew is Bathsheba. Pete Enns points out, it's almost like if you were telling a bedtime story to a child named Annie, and you started off saying, there once was a princess, Anna. And they were like, hey, that sounds like my name. And you think to yourself, exactly. Now I've got your attention. Now you're starting to put some pieces together. If you prefer later biblical authors take, though, later in the book of Chronicles, when they refer back to the daughter of Shua and to Bathsheba, both in their genealogies, the author uses the same Hebrew word to name them both, Bathsheba. So, later biblical authors seem to be making the very same connection between these two women and these two stories. Some more interesting parallels, though. David has a friend named Hiram, that appears in multiple accounts, and Judah has a friend named Hira in the story. Again, one letter difference. It's like this winking that keeps taking place in literary form. Judah and David both have a Tamar in their lives. In Judah's case, it was his daughter-in-law. In David's case, he named a daughter Tamar. And in both cases, the protagonist in the story commits a major act of sexual injustice and is forced to admit his guilt publicly. All of these details and parallels get included in this one short story 
that seems to be almost randomly inserted in a much bigger narrative of Genesis in the story of Judah and Tamar. And so the question worth wrestling with is, could anyone living in the height of the monarchy, in the days of King David, read the story of Judah and Tamar without also seeing the present day David and Bathsheba scandal in the text in front of them that they were reading or listening to? Now, you obviously get to make up your own mind about that, but I find it rather compelling. But even if you are persuaded by that evidence, a big question that lingers out there would still be, what is the author trying to do in making these parallels? One take could be that the author is critiquing David. He is speaking kind of truth to power. He's not using David's name, and just like the crucible or mash, he's using an older story as a subtle shield for his critique. And he's letting the readers kind of draw their own, their own conclusions as he's critiquing the power that's in play in his day. Or another take could be that as perhaps he's a supporter of King David, this author, and it's his way of saying, look, yes, I mean, this is going on, this scandal, David isn't a saint. But just like Judah wasn't a saint, this is just what happens with people in power and you kind of just have to accept it. After all, look at how God is otherwise using him. And it's the author's way of kind of at least naming the scandal, not trying to deny that it was happening, but not really holding him accountable for it. But I mean, these kinds of manipulative spin tactics are surely only something that would have been done in politics 3,000 years ago, right? I mean, certainly. That was just a them thing. Now, there's tons of more examples that Rensburg gets into of how these stories in Genesis are serving as a way for the author to speak to the times he currently finds himself in. And I don't have time to get into all of those. But to be clear, what's not at stake here is how historically accurate some of these stories of the patriarchs are or aren't in Genesis. Yet still, from purely a literary standpoint, they probably work better if at least some of the characters were known figures passed down through oral traditions of the Israelites. Just as Arthur Miller's play works better because the Salem Witch Trials was an actual event from history, and the Korean War actually did happen when it came to the setting for MASH. But again, their historical accuracy really isn't the point here in all the details. Rather, what I find extremely interesting is how authors were using stories of the past to speak into, critique, and draw parallels to the circumstances they were living right then in their own present moment. And we say this all the time. When it comes to the Bible, what was written down had to speak to the original people and what was being written, who it was, who it was being written for. It had to speak to them in their particular time and place and culture and context and history. And that works for the letters that we find in the New Testament, and it works for books like Genesis that we find in the Hebrew Scriptures. It had to apply to them to, at that point in time in the least. Now, why would I share all of this with you today? Which is basically kind of graduate school level work on the Bible, besides it just being interesting. Besides just going, you know what, huh, never even knew to consider that before. Why should I even care? What does it even have to do with our life today? Here's why. Because I want us to be reminded that the authors who wrote the Bible were constantly asking, even in a book like Genesis, full of all sorts of ancient stories and poems and accounts and mythologies, they were constantly asking, what is it that God is up to now in our present reality? And how do we speak into that? Because you see, I think that's the same invitation for you and I today as people of faith. But far too often, people's faith consists of trying to defend, did this particular event or story from the ancient past literally happen or not? Where their faith ends up getting lived out in a way where it's all about the past, defending their particular interpretation of words written thousands of years ago, standing up for it, fighting others over it, and all along in their mind thinking that they're honoring God in that, but doing it in ways that frankly look and sound nothing like Jesus and completely ignore the actual people in real circumstances right in front of them at the present moment. It's almost as if many people have a faith 
that is centered around a God that stopped speaking nearly 2,000 years ago at the conclusion of the last book that we find in the collection of the Bible, and that God hasn't had anything else relevant to say to particular contexts and cultures since then 2,000 years ago. Friends, that's not an active, living, relevant faith. And yet, it's good for us to be reminded, wait, (laughs) that's not even the tradition we're actually a part of. What we actually discover in the Bible is that we're a part of a long line of people who ask questions like, what does equality and justice look like now, today, in these particular circumstances of our world? Where does it look like to include and care and stand up for those marginalized by oppressive religious and political systems or oppressive institutions, oppressive voices today, in our time, in our nation, in our world? What does it look like to lovingly, boldly, and creatively critique and speak truth to powers that abuse their positions of influence for self-interest, that cause harm to vulnerable people today in the 21st century? And what does it look like to love and to serve and to show up for people right now in our world this week and this year? What does it look like to communicate their inherent value and worth to them in this particular moment of our world? What does generosity look like in our context today in 2024? What does kindness look like today in this moment right in front of me? What good does it do us? After all, to approach a story like Judah and Tamar in the book of Genesis and have our most passionate and religious discussions and arguments be around whether or not it all literally happened just the way it was written. What good does that actually accomplish, really? Regardless if you could ever prove it one way or another. Wouldn't it be a far better use of time to ask questions like, what about this particular ancient story should inform how we think today? What if it was being used to critique specific events or even excuse those same events in the 10th century? And so, in light of this story, I wonder uh, wonder in what ways are we excusing the mistreatment and abuse of women at the hands of men in powerful positions today? And what does it look like for us to wisely speak out against it? Or will we find ourselves excusing it? in the name of financial progress or the advancement of our preferred political agendas? You see, those are questions for someone that's trying to figure out what it looks like to live out the way and kingdom of Jesus in this world today, in the here and now, that believes that our faith matters for right now and how we live and speak and that God wants to speak into this moment right now. And so friends, my hope is that this will remind us that when some of us are tempted to just throw the Bible out because of how it's been weaponized against us and others that we care about in so many painful ways through the years, that within the Bible are actually some pretty amazing writers trying to figure out how to speak into their particular time and circumstances, and that it's possible that we may actually find ourselves being inspired in ways that we didn't necessarily think could even, that we didn't think about before if we're willing to wrestle with these stories and what they could mean for us today and how they could inspire us to live out faith today. But more importantly, may it remind us that as we seek to follow Jesus in the pattern of how we live our lives, by trying to live out this core truth of loving your neighbor as yourself, that we will spend the greatest amount of our time and energy trying to figure out what it looks like to live that heart out now in our culture and context today. Not trying to argue about what it was or wasn't like in some idealized past, in some different context and culture thousands of years ago, or trying to anticipate all the what-ifs of the future, but instead living out love and grace and kindness and truth and justice with the stories of our lives now. And letting those stories get passed on to others so that they too can wrestle with what it looks like to live out the way of Jesus and their specific time in place. So here's to living and loving well here and now. Cross point. Have a great week.
If you would like to know more or get connected to Crosspoint, go to crosspoint.org. If you're in need of care or assistance, go to crosspoint.org care. And welcome home.